So let's see what happens if um, this part of the cortex is damaged, as it was in this patient, uh, patient B, uh, a patient of Damasio's. Like I did with my patient W, Damasio interviews his patient and asks him if he has a self, uh, because uh, the prediction arising from uh, uh, Craig's theory is that uh, he should lack such a thing. Damasio says, do you have, this, this is a dialogue, a, a conversation which hasn't been published, but an article on this case has been published. Do you have a sense of self, says Damasio. Patient says, yes, I do. Uh, what if I told you that you weren't here right now? Patient says, I'd say you've gone blind and deaf. Damasio says, do you think that other people can control your thoughts? He says, no. So and why do you think that's not possible? He says, you control your own mind, hopefully. Marzia said, what if I were to tell you that your mind was the mind of somebody else? Patient says, when was the transplant? I mean, the brain transplant. Marzia, what if I were to tell you that I know you better than you know yourself? Patient says, I would think you're wrong. Marzia says, what if I were to tell you that you're aware that I'm aware? He says, I would say you're right. Marzia, you're aware that I'm aware? Patient, I'm aware that you're aware that I'm aware. Please note all these references to I. This is the very thing that's supposed to be missing uh, in such patients. So clearly the sentient being of the mind is neither in the prefrontal cortex nor in the insular cortex. But these patients have some cortex left. Uh, what about a patient who has absolutely no cortex? What if the cortex as a whole were to be removed? Surely this would remove the, 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 the sentient subjectivity uh, that we are seeking to explain with our cortical theory of consciousness. Well, here's a patient, uh, three years old, uh, this one, uh, with absolutely no cortex. This is a condition called hydran encephaly, where the patient is born with a brainstem uh, and a cerebellum, uh, which hangs off the back of the brainstem, but no forebrain at all. Is she conscious? Yes, she is. Yes, she is. She's awake. Uh, she goes to sleep at night. She wakes up in the morning. Clearly, she's conscious. But much more importantly, look at this. This is her reaction to her baby brother being placed on her lap. She responds emotionally uh, to this experience. So it's not only that she's awake. It's not some sort of blank uh, wakefulness, but a reactive mind with feelings and content. Uh, it's not, it cannot possibly be representational cognition of the kind that the cortex performs because she doesn't have any cortex. She has only a brainstem and yet she's conscious and her consciousness has a particular quality and it doesn't have anything to do with what's streaming in from the outside consciously because remember the brainstem only processes sensory information unconsciously. This has got to do with her subjective response to that information, even though she has no cognitive clue what that information um, is, is actually about. It's a pure, raw feeling. Uh, and it's not just her. Uh, most of these kids are like that. Here's another patient. Uh, uh, tell me this patient isn't conscious uh, and uh, that there's nobody home. Uh, Bjorn Merker wrote a review article about these patients who he studied a, a great many of them. And I'm not going to read you this long quotation, but you can see the words that I've, um, that I've emphasized in yellow. They have a wide range of emotions. Uh, and most importantly of all, those emotional responses are situationally appropriate. In other words, the, the patient shows laughter or irritability uh, or, or, or fear uh, in response to stimuli uh, which, which, which would evoke those same sort of feelings in you and me. So uh, this is a weighty piece of evidence that the cortical theory is wrong. Uh, the parts of the cortex that are supposed to be uh, the, the um, uh, centers for consciousness, the integrative centers where a sentient self comes about, uh, uh, it, 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 even just this, the, the little uh, in, in smatterings of evidence that I've given you this evening show that this, is, that this is not the case. And even in patients in whom there is absolutely no cortex, there's evidence that there is consciousness, consciousness not of the cognitive kind that we've been focusing on uh, in our attempts to solve the hard problem, but rather consciousness of a far more rudimentary kind, basic 
raw feelings of the type that you saw these two little girls uh, and, and other children like them with the same condition um, able to express. But of course, you know, how do we know, um, how do we know that, that, that what, what it's like to be such a, is there anything it's like to be such a child? These are just behaviors. We can't be sure uh, what, what, what they're experiencing. You can remove the cortex, the supposed seat of consciousness in its entirety. And I say remove, of course, in these children, uh, it's not removed uh, experimentally. In experimental animals, it is removed. Uh, and we find exactly the same thing. They are conscious, they, they're awake, uh, and they display a full range of, of, of emotional and situationally appro appropriate uh, emotional responses. By contrast with that lesion evidence, now we look at the brain stem, if there's damage in these structures, these, these tiny structures in the primitive brain stem called the reticular activating system, then the lights go out. So the lights do not go out uh, if there's no cortex, but if, you, if, if, if there's tiny lesions in the reticular activating system of the brain stem, as small as two cubic millimeters, Fisher and colleagues recently published uh, a, a article in which they studied numerous patients with brainstem strokes and showed that a two cubic millimeter lesion in the parabrachial region is all that's required to totally obliterate consciousness. So what that shows uh, is that cortical consciousness is dependent upon brainstem consciousness. What, what's generated here in the reticular activating system is a prerequisite for cortical consciousness. And what is more, remember that cortical consciousness is not always present. In other words, the cortex is able to process information without consciousness. So what makes it conscious is activation by this reticular activating system. Now that's not controversial, what I've just said to you. Uh, we're, I, I, I'm making the argument we're looking in the wrong place. Uh, you know, this is not intrinsically conscious. This is the foundation of consciousness. Why don't we look there? Um, and I've showed you in those uh, uh, hydranencephalic girls uh, that uh, the people who only have a brainstem have consciousness of a particular type, and that is affective consciousness. Uh, so is this not th this intrinsic prerequisite for all of the other forms of consciousness? Uh, is this not the place that we should be looking uh, if we're trying to find out what the functional mechanism of consciousness is? Um, so let me now go to my case five. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm very much aware that in the case of these kids uh, with no cortex, you can't be sure that they have consciousness because they can't speak. Uh, the one function which certainly is cortical is language. Uh, and my patient W was able to describe his mental states because he had the sliver of, of frontal cortex, uh, which, which, uh, which enables us to produce language. Those children didn't. So we don't know. They can't tell us what they're experiencing, just like our pet dogs and cats can't tell us what they're experiencing. We, we, we sense that they're conscious. They respond emotionally. We have relationships with them, but we can't know for sure. So in science, in such a situation, what we have to do is rely upon multiple lines of converging evidence. We have to make predictions. Uh, on the hypothesis that the brainstem produces consciousness, uh, on the lesion studies suggest that that's where the consciousness comes from. Uh, and I'm saying it is a consciousness of a particular type, it's feeling, it's affective consciousness. Then uh, using another method, uh, for example, deep brain stimulation, if we stimulate those structures, those deep brainstem structures in patients who do have intact cortex and can tell us what they experience, we might predict that they would experience intense affects. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, if you stimulate the substantia nigra, um, uh, which, is, which is a midbrain part of the reticular activating system, this is what happens. In a patient, a um, 65 year old patient with Parkinson's disease, that's why the uh, stimulator was put into her brain. Um, but a patient who'd never had any psychiatric pathology in her life, within five seconds of the stimulator being uh, switched on, uh, it had actually gone deeper than the intended site. The intended site was not in the brainstem. It went a few millimeters too deep into the reticular activating nucleus that I mentioned. 
And she, within five seconds, she falls into a depression. I'm falling down in my head. I no longer wish to live, to see anything, hear anything, feel anything. Uh, when asked if she's in pain, she says, no, I'm fed up with life. I've had enough. I don't want to live anymore. I'm disgusted with life. Everything is useless. Always feeling worthless. I'm scared in this world. Please note this. I don't want to live anymore. A suicidal depression. When asked why she's so sad, she says, I'm tired. I want to hide in a corner. I'm crying over myself, of course. I'm hopeless. Why am I bothering you? After the stimulation, within 90 seconds, the, the depression disappears. The patient very uh, bravely or generously agreed to do a double-blind trial after that, uh, where Blomstedt stimulated either in the higher structure that he had aimed for or in the reticulate structure that he had struck uh, accidentally um, without the patient knowing where he was stimulating. And every time that he stimulated in the, in the reticulate nucleus, uh, she fell into this deep despair. So this is a second line of evidence. You can actually stimulate intense emotions by stimulating those deep brainstem structures. Here's a third line of evidence, functional imaging, PET imaging in this case. These are normal subjects with intense uh, emotional states. They are feeling intensely sad, angry, happy, or fearful. The, the PET imaging shows where in the brain uh, the, uh, the, the uh, activity is that's generating this mental state. And in all of these cases, it's in the brain stem. Uh, sadness, anger, uh, happiness, fear. Look at what's going on in the cortex, next to nothing. Uh, so it's absolutely clear uh, by this method too that the affects are generated um, in the brain stem. One last line of evidence is psychopharmacology. Um, psychiatrists tinker with the uh, neuromodulatory chemicals that are sourced in these very same brainstem nuclei. So antidepressants increase serotonin, uh, which is sourced in the RAFE nuclei of the reticular activating system. Antipsychotics block dopamine, which is sourced in the ventral tegmental area of the reticular activating system. Uh, some anti-anxiety drugs uh, block noradrenaline, uh, which is sourced in the locus ceruleus complex of the reticular activating system. Uh, if all that this system did was woke you up or sort of produced a sort of background level of consciousness, uh, which is the standard view of what this part of the brain is doing, uh, this is why when you lesion it, you go into a coma, uh, then anesthetists might be interested um, in these brain structures and these uh, and these brain chemicals. But no, psychiatrists are. Psychiatrists, doctors for feelings, uh, treating emotional disorders. Uh, the, cl clearly, these, 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 these neuromodulators sourced in the reticular activating system have, have something fundamental to do with feeling. So let me just sum up. Uh, I'm going to tell you about another one of these neuromodulators uh, in, in a few minutes if I, if I get that far. But let me just sum up uh, uh, what I'm saying. I'm saying that, it's, that the evidence uh, is very strong that the source of consciousness, remember the subtitle of my book, is this hidden spring. Deep in, in the reticular brainstem are structures which are prerequisite for consciousness to occur. Uh, th th think of uh, the, the, the forebrain or the cortex as a sort of a tele television set um, and uh, think of this as the power supply. Um, the standard view is, well, of course, you know, co consciousness happens in the cortex. Uh, like Televisual program transmission happens in the television set. It has to have a power supply. It has to be plugged in at the wall. But that doesn't mean that the source of television is the power supply. Uh, but as you've just seen, uh, if you tinker with this power supply, you change the program. Uh, you change the actual televisual content. It's not just a power supply. It is literally um, the, 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 the font of consciousness. And because it's prerequisite for these cortical forms of consciousness, you, the, the cortex isn't conscious unless it's aroused by the brain stem. And because, I've, as I've showed you, the brain stem is generating not some power supply, but rather consciousness with a particular content and quality, a particular feel, a particular something that it is likeness, that means the foundational, elemental, basic form of consciousness is feeling. And 
Feeling is prerequisite for all other forms of consciousness. 